right. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Peter. Uh -huh. I'm Steve Heston from University of Maryland. I should mention that this paper is co-authored with Shui Chi Li, uh, who is a PhD student and um, uh, plans to be on the job market this year. So Shui Chi, I saw that you were there uh, on the Zoom chat. And so please speak up if I say something that needs correction. Uh, yeah, hi, um, Steve. Yeah, thank you for introducing me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all right. Um, and uh, Peter will hopefully monitor the chat in case Shui Chi or others want to issue corrections. So I'm going to share my screen now. And um, <clears throat> use PowerPoints because I've got a little pen I can use for writing. So the, the title is Option Momentum. And this paper was uh, largely inspired by literature that um, started with a paper by uh, Peter Carr and Luren Wu. And um, this paper has a methodological contribution, which is um, to compute model-free hedged portfolios on the model-free fixed portfolio. Okay? And um, exasperatingly enough, the literature doesn't do this. <clears throat> so we have done it. And now we have the equivalent of the crisp monthly filed stock returns, but these are option returns on portfolios of options on individual stocks. Right. So what would you do if you were the first one with the, well, first, I, I should mention that this is the right way to measure the variance premium, right? The, it's the return premium on a portfolio of options, which is delta neutral and at least roughly uncorrelated with stock returns. We want to know what in reward do investors get for variance risk? Right. And we applied this to the cross section of returns to measure momentum. Uh, right? There are a lot of things we uh, could look at. You can look at size, beta, value, and things. And uh, momentum is one of the first ones. Uh, to refresh your memory, um, stock momentum lasts for about one year and reverses in the long term. Uh, we find that optional momentum exists certainly for one year, but actually lasts for up to five years and does not reverse. So the stock momentum and optional momentum have some uh, features in common, but not all of them. In particular, option momentum has a quarterly periodicity. So it's stronger at some lags than it is at others. Uh, this is an interesting um, new finding. And, but uh, the basic lesson is we have a methodology to measure returns, and we use this methodology to show option momentum. Right. Steve, I got a question. I mean, so yes. um, not disputing that the literature doesn't do something, but the literature does definitely calculate variance risk premia. And um, let's say one interpretation of variance risk premia is that you're um, calculating the sort of excess profits, I don't know what the right word is, average um, profit from a um, actual trading strategy. So what is, um, so, you know, so I'm trying to distinguish what you're, you know, what, sure. you're, what you did. Well, what you're saying they didn't suppose get. you asked Roger Ibbotson, okay. um, who wrote the Ibbotson and Singapore paper, you know, what is the equity premium? Or for that matter, you surveyed finance professors, which has been done. Right? Okay. Finance professors would generally say the equity premium is around, uh, at least the historical equity premium, is around 8% per year, meaning that if you bought a portfolio of a diversified stock portfolio of U.S. stocks, on average, it earned 8% more per year than treasury bills. Agreed. Right. Okay, there's, there's a great consensus on that. If you ask option theorists, they might say, well, the risk neutral volatility is this, and the average time series volatility is that, or they, they give you various other things, but they wouldn't uniformly answer with a measure of return. And the reason is that options are levered Right, option portfolios are highly levered, and you have to define the portfolio. Oh, okay. Now I'm getting your point. So, let's say variance risk premium is not a return. That's that's your point. It's a uh, it's. Well, I, well I'm going to say it is now. Okay, but it is I, now. But, but, listen, but you're saying the people other than you who calculated did work with variance risk premium. They weren't calculating returns per se. Is is that the that, point? That's right. Yeah. And this would not be acceptable, or is not acceptable 
for you know state of the art empirical asset pricing. Okay. If you own no, dividends or have survived, yeah. so I'm going to show you how to compute option returns. Okay, got it. Yeah. yeah okay. A, a very modest objective. <clears throat> so uh, let me get to the theoretical slide. Uh, here we are. Um, slideshow from current slide. All right. The. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about um, what portfolio I want to measure the return on. And it's going to be the VIX portfolio. That's a portfolio constructed using the VIX methodology, uh, which equation one there shows uh, weights options O with, um, <coughs> one second, with weights equal, equal to or proportional to one over the strike price squared. If you actually graph the payoff on this option portfolio, you know, doing an option diagram, as uh, many of you know, you get a U-shaped graph. So let me see if I can draw here. You get something that looks like this. <clears throat> and how would we figure out the value of that portfolio? Well, if you ask Breeden and Litzenberger, they'd say, oh, you can replicate this with a bunch of butterfly spreads. A butterfly spread, you pick a point there with options and draw a very steep butterfly spread that pays off at that point. You can pick another point and do a steep butterfly spread and do that. And you can do one there. And if you connect all the dots along here with butterfly spreads, you get a good approximation to the integral or the sum of all those options. You might say, wait a minute, you've got all the triangles, but you've only got half the area underneath. And if you did Riemann's rectangle rule, you would use rectangles instead of triangles. So we will double it. And you can justify formally uh, this procedure by integrating by parts. So this VIX portfolio is nice because it's model free. I didn't have to estimate any parameters. And this is a well established methodology there's, of course, the S&P 500 VIX, which we call the VIX, but there's a treasury VIX, there's a three-month VIX, <clears throat> and now there are uh, VIXs, or they're called equity VIX portfolios on individual stocks. So you can buy a Google VIX or an Apple VIX um, right now. And these represent the prices um, of actual option portfolios that are model free. So that's very successful and popular, and that's the portfolio I'm going to focus on, but I want to use a dynamic hedge. So, <clears throat> so how would we hedge this option portfolio? Um, well, I want to point out that um, the payoff on this has a logarithmic term, which is, of course is nonlinear, and then it has a linear term. Right? The linear term is easy to hedge with stock, the nice thing about the VIX portfolio is it has a static option term plus a dynamic stock component. So how do we hedge this um, log part? <clears throat> well, uh, after a deep mathematics, we, we concluded that the derivative of the log of S is one over S. <laughs> so if you buy one over S shares at a price of S, the total cost of the hedge is $1. And yes, there's, there's a factor of two. So it's actually a $2 hedge, but <clears throat> we construct a dynamic hedge, which uh, continuously sh um, uh, hedges by $2 of stock. And then uh, I apply a Taylor series approximation uh, to the resulting return. And I find that you can approximate the, the dollar return, not percentage, but the dollar return on this hedged option portfolio by this sum of squares here, the sum of squares of daily returns. And that's because the, the logarithm of the stock price telescopes into the product of daily returns, the, the product of gross returns. And the gross return or the continuously compounded return are roughly the same thing. So a Taylor series approximation tells us that uh, at, the dollar payoff on the, my daily hedge portfolio is approximately just the sum of squared returns, or if you want to be meticulous, excess returns over the daily risk-free rate. 
So <clears throat> this is a shortcut explanation of the uh, Carr and Wu, and th this actually dates back to some uh, work with Dilla Madan also. Mm -hmm. This shows that um, you can approximate the realized variance or the return on a variance swap by a portfolio of options that is hedged daily in the underlying stock. So let me pause here for questions because there might be some interpretive issues. You know, uh, many people are familiar with the equations, but um, this is a very abbreviated derivation. And um, uh, this is the foundation of my empirical analysis. I have a question. Yes. So um, the um, statement is that equation one is model free. Yes. The but your um, uh, ratios are uh, involved deltas, delta sub i. Is there a hidden model dependence there? Well, when I say it's model free, and the model free uh, term for the VIX portfolio is not my invention, it's <clears throat> the point is that I don't yet need to estimate the mean reversion or yeah, the level of volatility. Yeah, can I jump in? That yes. delta i means difference in strike, it doesn't mean like first derivative of option price with respect to underlying. Right, Steve? Oh, yes. <clears throat> this, yeah. uh, this delta here is just the difference between strike adjacent strike prices. Yeah. So delta for difference in strike price is not um, the delta of an option. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you, Peter. I didn't appreciate yeah. that. Okay. <clears throat> so um, I, I think I cited on the next slide, but um, <clears throat> I the uh, Akarn Wu paper is one of my favorite papers. And um, when I talked to Luren Wu, he said, well, that he thought of it as a theoretical paper and just did the application to individual stock returns <laughs> um, <clears throat> to show the referee that it could actually be applied. So he, he viewed that as a sort of casual addition to the paper rather than the foundation. He thought it was a theoretical paper. And I like this paper. I agree with everything that's 100% right, except I think there's a sign error in the paper yeah. that completely reverses the conclusions. This paper shows that you can use options, and that's Carl Wu's paper, so you can use options to replicate a variance swap, a theoretical, idealized, platonic variance swap that exists only in a perfect mathematical world. And I think that the paper should be using variance swaps to approximate returns on option por portfolios that we can actually measure. <clears throat> okay. So I want option theorists to start making predictions for option returns. So instead of using options to approximate something else, I want to use the math to approximate option returns. And then we can work with actual empirical measured, uh, empirically measured daily returns on constructible portfolios. So by option returns, you mean returns on portfolios of options, right? Yes, okay. that's right. Returns on observable portfolios of options, not okay. idealized continuous uh, you know, portfolios that we can't observe. Okay. So, um, okay. And I become progressively agitated or irritated by the literature because they're papers that I like. I, I, I'm not going to bother citing any papers that uh, I don't think are, are good. It takes a really good paper to arouse my ire. So Stein, back in 89, used Black-Scholes implied volatilities to predict realized volatilities. Right. Well, that was an early paper, and that actually was um, really pioneered the idea of the expectations hypothesis that we should use options to predict stuff. All right, Probably not volatility, because uh, volatility does not have an unbiased estimator. So then um, Christensen and uh, Prabala and Balerslav Howe and Zoe used the, the VIX or the squared VIX to predict realized variance on the market. And that's just like this variance swap for approximation. And it's inspired by the idea that, um, that if there's no risk premium, then the VIX variance should equal the expectation of the realized variance. Okay, that's fine, but it's still not a return. Now, Akar and Wu uh, developed this variance swap approximation. And uh, I, as I'll show you shortly, it's um, 
for the VIX, it doesn't matter. For the S&P 500 VIX, that there's a 99% correlation between um, the realized variance and the return on the portfolio, I'll show you. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I can't really come here and thump my chest and say, Shui Chi and I have increased the cor correlation from 99% to 100%. But now suppose I go snooping around individual stock returns and I find the stocks that have the biggest um, approximation error. And of course, when I'm snooping for investment strategies, right, I might really magnify the, um, uh, the error and search over hundreds or thousands of stocks to find this. And let's suppose more PhD students write dissertations using energy options and uh, fixed income options and currency options. Well, those securities have stochastic volatility and large jumps. And those are ones where all these Taylor series approximations have large error terms. <clears throat> so the approximation which will work well for VIX is suspect in other cases. <clears throat> and in any case, we don't need to use the approximation. We can actually construct the daily hedge portfolio with no approximation and we can do empirical work. Right. <clears throat> so uh, the alternative to using something like variance swap is to actually construct a portfolio and delta hedge it daily. Uh, so uh, Gurdiv Bakshi and Kapadia did this. And the limitation of that is that you have to choose your option. You choose an at the money option or an at the money forward option. You choose a put or a call. You do some waiting. But um, that was a good idea, well intentioned. And um, my answer is when given a choice, take both. So I want to take the, the portfolio we all know and love, the VIX portfolio, and then I want to delta hedge it. And the nice thing is that since the VIX portfolio is model independent, the delta of the VIX por portfolio is also model independent. So I have the, the best of both. I have the return on a daily hedged um, uh, or model free portfolio and the return on this portfolio in dollar terms is approximately equal to the realized variance. So if you like to predict realized variance, I got you covered. If you like to predict return, I've still got you covered. They're highly correlated in the analysis and I might be sloppy and not even distinguish them carefully because they're roughly the same thing. And to avoid any further um, issues, uh, that Shui Chi and I measure um, monthly returns from the third Friday to the third Friday of option expiration. So there's no interpolation, interpolation across maturity or interpolation across strike prices. So this is very clean. And, and so we're measuring monthly returns on the option calendar, third Friday to the third Friday, instead of the, the normal uh, you know, calendar month calendar. So that we never have to you know, uh, sell one option to buy another and match a weighted maturity. We're always just holding options till expiration. Okay. Uh, any questions or concerns here? Um, could you clarify the middle bullet point where it said for in Car and Wu for S&P 500 VIX, it is 99% correlated with the Okay, so yeah, let, let me move on and show you some okay. summary statistics. All right. But, um, <clears throat> The, the issue I have with Carr and Wu, and not so much Carr and Wu, but the, what I'll call the uncritical embracement of a, a really great technique by the literature, that uh, the approximations depend on some higher moments because mm -hmm. uh, it's based on a diffusion approximation. And it's not clear how accurate that diffusion approximation is in different settings. Right? If I were to apply it to currencies or fixed income, or you know, energy options or options on VIX, the fat tails might be a problem. Okay. And so the answer is you measure it both ways and see how big of a problem it is. And if you can measure it both ways, you really need to only measure it the return way. And that's what I'm going to proceed to do. So I will sh I'll show you this number. Yeah, so I'm just actually unclear what your objective is. So. Like I grant that you cannot replicate variance perfectly. And then let's say a choice is to make the target be variance or a choice is to not make the target be variance. Um, 
And, um, you know, so I'm not sure which road you're going down. Well, I want to measure returns and measure the accuracy of this approximation. And then after I measure the accuracy of the approximation, I want to ignore it and just play around with returns to see whether I can predict returns. Yeah, so returns on portfolios with, let's say, a finite number of options, not an infinite number. Is that? Is, yes, um, I will use a finite number of options, mm -hmm. where finite usually means six. Okay. But uh, <clears throat> I hope that's finite enough for you. And um, they're going to, there's going to be a daily hedge in the underlying stock, but the option portfolio will be created on the third Friday of a month and held to yeah. expiration on the third Friday of the next month. Yeah. So it actually took a surprising amount of work or thought to do something very simple and <laughs> to just choose a, a natural portfolio of options and hold them delta hedge to expiration. The nice thing uh, is that this, the, the dollar return- Oh, I'm getting it now. Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so the dollar me. return on this option portfolio okay. happens to be a close approximation to uh, a, a realized variance. Yeah, well, okay, returns are both positive and negative. Realized variance can only be positive. Um, so what you're saying is, that there's, um, you know, say, when you do a linear regression of, of realized variance on returns, or maybe the other way around, there's a, you know, the R squared is is around is ninety nine percent. Is that is that? Yes. Ninety eight because we have that's, that's right. Eight. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, here I have some summary statistics, and um, by the way, we have an expanded version of the table in, in case Shui Chi gets upset. But uh, I have a little pen here I, want, I like to use to write, and I can't write on Adobe Acrobat. So you'll, I'll just promise you that the average number of stocks we have with options is around 300 per month. And we have around six different strike prices per option. So we require a minimum number of strike prices, um, and uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we have a limited number. And we ha apply a number of filters that have been used in the literature so that um, uh, Right, that we have enough options on each stock. And what do we have here? We have a measure of the average equity VIX return. So on average, we lose 4% per month on these portfolios. Right. So if we invest $100 on the third Friday of a month and daily hedge, uh, remember that options are highly levered. So you can buy a lot of options for $100. But if we do this, on average, we have about $96 left. If we use Karn Wu's variance swap approximation, uh, there's a slight difference. It's we would lose two dollars and sixty-four cents per hundred. Mm -hmm. So you might say, "Wow, that Karn Wu approximation is really bad. We should never use it. It's more than a percent off," which seems like a lot until you realized the standard uh, deviations of these portfolios are around hundred dollars per month. So these are highly levered uh, portfolios which buy at the money and out of the money options. So actually that's not a, a huge difference, you know, of uh, what is it? One and a half percent. Per yeah, month. you said standard deviations are in dollars, but they're actually in percentages, right? Because yes, I've with... transformed everything to percent, but the, right. the realized right. variance is more of a dollar measure. The realized variance divided by the price of the portfolio is the gross return or what we call the variance swap return. Okay. So, so VS, VSR is variance swap return. That's the Karn Wu approximation expressed as a percentage return. Okay. And the equity VIX return is the actual return on a, a dynamically hedged portfolio. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so um, we can actually construct an equally weighted portfolio of these um, equity VIX portfolios. So each equity VIX portfolio is a portfolio of options on one stock, around six options, sometimes a few more or less. And then we take a, an equally weighted portfolio of these portfolios and uh, find in that case that uh, both the variance swap approximation and the, uh, the actual return uh, lose between three and 4% per month. Okay, so on average, you do quite well. But this is like the finance professor who put his head in the freezer and his feet in the oven 
on average, he was quite comfortable. <laughs> right? We might overestimate the return on some um, equity VIX and underestimate it. The average correlation at the individual level was 75% between the, um, the variant swap approximate return and the actual dynamically hedged return. 75% right? is not too bad, but I'm going to be sorting stocks and looking for ones with unusual properties. Right. <laughs> I see Ryan Robick has turned into a dog, and I don't know if that's uh, good or bad. Uh, and I was hoping, Steve, that you weren't going to notice that my eight-year-old changed my profile name to his name. As Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm blaming it on him, not on you, Kevin. <laughs> uh, that's right. <laughs> and, and in fact, that is my dog, yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, it's come to my attention that this correlation measure is actually kind of optimistic. First of all, if you square the correlation, that's the R squared, and it's down closer to 50%. But in some, um, some unwritten experiments with things, I found sometimes the correlation was high, but the beta was not one. So the variance swap return might be um, more volatile or less volatile. And up at the top two rows, you can see this the monthly standard deviation was 85% for the actual dynamic return, the dynamically hedged return, but the variance swap has 100% standard deviation, 101.93. So even if they were highly correlated, the variance swap return is still not a perfect measure of the correct return. Right. And of course, for some stocks, uh, for the lower 5% of stocks, sorted, the correlation is only 13%. So some stocks, I don't know what they do, they go crazy and they have um, months where these, you know, the, the squared return, or I guess days where the squared return uh, is not a good approximation to what it's supposed to be with this dynamically hedged portfolio. So, um, okay. Oh, uh, just a couple other summary statistics. If we look at the beta of the stocks, the beta of this option portfolio is negative two. Remember, it's levered. <clears throat> Even though it's delta hedged, it, it, the beta with respect to the stock is strongly negative. And the beta with respect to the S&P 500 is even more negative. The reason is that these portfolios are delta hedged, not beta hedged. And we know that uh, when the market goes down, volatility goes up on average, right? There's like a 70% correlation negatively mm -hmm. between volatility and the stock market. So when you delta hedge a portfolio, um, you still have this Vega risk and Vega or variance is a negative beta asset. So <clears throat> um, long-term capital management found this out the hard way. If you sell a lot of options like at the money straddles and you think you're hedged with the Black-Scholes formula, you're not really hedged because if the market goes down, implied volatility is going to rise and a short position in options will lose money. So I'm um, <clears throat> uh, just pointing that out because these portfolios may not have uh, exactly the features you would think of from an idealized Black-Scholes world. Okay. Question? Yes. Um, there are stocks um, traditionally understood to have negative correlation uh, with the market, for example, gold stocks. Yes. So do you look at them separately or are they just part of your portfolio? Um, if there are gold stocks and they've got options, they're in there. Uh, we haven't looked at them individually, but... Because um, they'll behave exactly the opposite when the market goes down they'll go up and their volatility will decline. Hmm. Well, wait, when uh, the market goes down, the volatility of, um, of I mean, gold stocks skew. declines? Yeah, gold stocks traditionally have a re reverse skew. They, they okay. okay. Um, <coughs> and they're exceptional in that way. Yes, yeah. well, I, I imagine they would be positive. That would be something interesting to look at. And uh, you know this method. This is the first application of this methodology. I hope that there are many more. But this can be applied to gold stocks or gold futures options, 
currencies, fixed income, everything. And yes, I would expect gold that the betas of uh, options on gold stocks or options on gold futures to have exactly the opposite sign, to be positive if you uh, construct these portfolios. All right. So, um, hi, Steve. Uh, may I say something? Uh, so, uh, for the question, uh, here we are only using the uh, SP500 constituent stocks. So, we only use lots of firms in the SP500. But it says 650 firms. So, how can you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we use all the firms that were included in the uh, index okay. during the sample period, so 20 years. So, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, at, at the beginning of the sample, we did not include the Google, but that was added to the S&P 500 midway. Okay, that's clear. <clears throat> okay, so we have this methodology that, <clears throat> that it produces returns that are often highly correlated with variance swap returns. And now we have monthly returns on stocks. So this table, sorry, I have to adjust my uh, windows, table two, <clears throat> is my attempt to be as unoriginal as possible so that you can trust me. If you're familiar with the stock momentum paper by Jagadish and Titman, 1993, visually this looks identical. <clears throat> what Jagadish and Titman do and what Shui Chi and I did is to form portfolios, look at past returns on the portfolios uh, and just sort them into deciles buy the best decile of winners, sell the worst decile of losers, and hold it in the future. <clears throat> so um, Jagadish and Titman wanted to show this robust, was robust, or they couldn't make up their mind. So they decided to form portfolios based on historical periods of three, six, nine, or 12 months in the past, and hold those portfolios in the future for three, six, nine, or 12 months in the future. So in an attempt to avoid originality, Shui Chi and I did the same thing. The, uh, the only difficulty is that we can't hold a one month option for three, six, nine or 12 months because it expires. So we have returns on these VIX portfolios each month and we would simply buy a portfolio in the underlying equity VIX uh, portfolio, hold it for a month and roll the proceeds over into the one month options next month. And we did this for three, six, nine, or 12 months. Right? In contrast, Jigadish and Titman could buy a stock and hold it reinvesting the dividends for a full three, six, nine, or 12 months without trading. But that's the only difference, that, and there's one other difference if you compare the tables, which is the decimal point. Um, <clears throat> Jagadish and Titman found profits of around 1% per month on their portfolios. And we find returns that are almost 10% per month. For example, if you form a portfolio or a desktop portfolio, whoops, based on the past three months and you hold the winners, buy the winners and sell the losers, holding them for three months, you make around 10% per month. Remember, option portfolios are very volatile and implicitly highly levered. So the corresponding number with stock momentum is about 1%, but it's much less risky. Our, our, so our T-stat is quite high. We get a nice sharp ratio, a T-stat of 5.9. And you can look throughout the table to see similar results. I, I see, for example, 9.52%. 8.67, 7.64, the, uh, the winners always outperform the losers at all horizons for all formation lags, and the results are always highly significant. Um, also remember that uh, even though we trade the stock uh, to, to daily hedge these portfolios, these, uh, this is momentum in option portfolios, which are delta neutral at all times, even though they may have somewhat of a negative correlation. This is an effect of volatility exposure, not of underlying equity exposure. Okay. 
So if people are quiet, and I don't know if that means they're bored or confused, but um, this is the simplest so thing. What's that? I have a question. This is David. Yes. David. Yeah. I'm just I'm struggling with this um, this assumption that the that you have um, you know the delta neutral, and maybe you covered this before, and I, I somehow missed it. But how can you guarantee these portfolios are delta neutral? Well, um, <clears throat> let, let me give answers of uh, varying mathematical sophistication. Yeah. <laughs> the, each individual option price, it, okay, <clears throat> I'm using the log portfolio approximation. So if I used an infinite number of strike prices, which Peter Carr really has no problem with, <laughs> if I did that, I have this payoff that involves the log portfolio, and I can take the derivative of the log of S, which is one over S. We established that. That's, yeah. So I'm using the delta of the continuous portfolio, even though the actual portfolios I, I construct have, you know, like five, six, or seven options. Yeah, so, so it's not short, exact. The actual portfolio you're holding is not delta neutral as a result of not having an infinite number of strikes in them. Okay, so, that's true. Let me see yeah. what is the actual delta. I, <clears throat> oh, here we, oh, here we have it in table one. We, we do compute the Black-Scholes delta, and yes, I'll admit that um, that's not completely model-free, but the delta is negative 0 0.05. So the delta is very close to zero. And if we had an infinite number of strike prices, we would make it zero. Yeah, Using a if you want to know why that is, David. <laughs> so if, if, you know, how can it be one ask that, you know, if, you, if only you had an infinite number of strike prices, that you can know the delta of a portfolio of options when you don't know the model. That's, you know, the fundamental question. Um, so the first, so, well, a small caveat, you actually are making restrictions, but on, so there is some assumptions on dynamics, but let's not get into that. That's kind of a, let's say, it's gonna take us a far, far afield. And so, so the way I'd say it is that as you go across different models in a big class, the form of the value function for when the for the log payoff is some function of stock price plus some function of plus literally squared sigma. So that when you differentiate with respect to stock price, you, you get rid of the dependence on squared sigma. Okay, so you so at so at this point you've calculated a delta that doesn't even depend on sigma. So that's very unusual, very unusual, okay? Like for a typical option, of course, when you calculate delta, it depends on sigma. For this particular portfolio of options, which is only theoretical, then when you calculate its delta, it, that delta does not depend on sigma, okay? So, so that's how you're able to know delta without knowing, you know, without knowing sigma. I sort, of, I sort of see the theoretical idea here, but okay. I'm gonna ask a very practical question which is mm -hmm. if I were working on the street and I was faced with this problem, I might've said, well, why don't we, if we're gonna to try to construct returns and do attribution, let's uh, regress the option return on the, um, you know, the underlying and the VIX, a pure VIX futures or something like that, something tradable, right? And come mm -hmm. with, a, with a variance decomposition and figure out you know, how to attribute uh, you know, returns to the stock and the part of the VIX that's correlated with the stock uh, and then, and then a residual, which is correlated with the balance of the, the VIX return. That could be another way to approach this problem to get a pure, like a volatility premium. Well, David, I don't disagree with you, but when we say VIX, we usually mean the S and P 500 VIX, and but we're using yeah, there's, there's uh, we're constructing on these other options too, on these other equities. Yes. So the same principle would apply. I'm just trying to say that if I'm trying to measure the return. Uh, you know, in a model free way, why don't I just empirically just look at, at least as a comparison, you know, the return that, that's caused by the, the underlying versus the return that's caused by the, the, the futures on the VIX. Uh, but, there, but we don't have futures traded on equity VIXs for all the ah, S&P okay. 500 stocks. So presumably you could do this for the S&P 500 though. Yes, that's right. And I showed that in that case, there's 99% correlation with the car variance swap methodology which is actually good news for a lot of people, but um, you know you need this methodology if you use individual stocks or other fat-tailed assets. Okay, and my last question, if you don't mind me taking another minute. Sure. Uh, 
I've been reading some papers lately about the um, systematic factor in idiosyncratic variances. Yes. Uh, and do, do you take that into account or just kind of push that aside for the moment? What about putting it aside? Do you take that into account in your in your analysis in any way? Or are you, you kind of setting that aside for some, uh, you know? Well, um, I'll, I'll say we don't really know. We haven't focused on that. But it's an interesting question of what is causing this effect. For example, is the premium twice as large in half of the stocks and negligible in others? In gold stocks, does the premium go the other direction? And we haven't yet explored that. So these are, are good potential topics for future research. OK, I always like that answer, too. <laughs> OK. I see what you're saying. Um, yeah. So let me get back to the slides here. Thank you. <clears throat> and. Uh, Okay, so here are the decile portfolios using um, right, formation periods of several months and holding periods of several month, months. And I think that should convince you that there's something going on here. And I want to explore it in a manner that's a little more complex than just decile portfolios to see what's going on. Not, not why it's going on, I just want to see what is going on with returns. So uh, the, the Car Wu methodology says that the gross return, a one plus three return, is approximately the realized variance, divide, that is the daily squared returns, divided by the risk neutral variance, which is the price of VIX portfolio. <clears throat> okay. And I'm going to say the continuously compounded return, that is the log of this, is equal to the log of the realized variance minus the log of the, um, the VIX variance. And I want to look at how much predictability there is. So uh, if we have negligible risk premium, then the log of the VIX will, will be a really good prediction of the log of future realized variance. <clears throat> so to see what the dynamics of realized variance versus VIX variance are, I'm just going to do a time series regression with realized variance and uh, the VIX variance, regressing them on their lags to see how predictable is VIX, uh, VIX variance, or, or the square of VIX, how predictable is realized variance, and then I'm going to difference them, and the difference between the, the logarithm of the realized variance and the, I'm going to use my red pen here, All right? If I take the log of the realized variance vi minus the log of the VIX variance, well, that's equal to uh, the compound return, continuously compounded return on the portfolio, at least approximately. Okay, so here's the graph of coefficients going back to five years of monthly lags. And we see a couple things. One, <clears throat> the VIX variance is highly persistent. This is 0.85. So if you look at a one or two or three month lag, VIX is very persistent, which comes as no shock to any practitioners or anyone who just looks at volatility in the market. <coughs> All right. And it decays over time. Right. But it's still, you know, non-trivial after five years. If we look at realized variance, which might be a somewhat noisy measure, Realized variance is much less persistent. It starts at around 50% here, right? And it also decays. So this tells us that the price of options is more persistent than the actual realized variance on the underlying stocks. That is good news. <laughs> so, so That's good news. Well, it means when one of the I think, rare instances in finance where the actual tradable is actually like more you know, persistent, hence more bettable than the theoretical concept. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Now, and this graph, oh, I didn't anticipate mm -hmm. this, but, uh, and neither did Shui Chi. Uh, he can pipe in if I'm lying. Uh, notice that there, there's this quarterly pattern at three, six, nine, 12 months, and it goes on for five years. There's a quarterly um, seasonality or periodicity in volatility that I had not heard of, and we don't know why, and we have done some unreported diagnostics to see if it's earnings or if it's the option calendar or something, 
and we don't know why. <coughs> and and um, this is actually heartwarming that the market anticipates this, right? There's a quarterly seasonality in actual uh, realized volatility and a matching quarterly seasonality in the price of that volatility. Yeah, it's amazing, huh? <laughs> but, so that's good in the sense that the graphs look similar, but they should be about the same, right? If, if you believe that the price of variance uh, ha should be well, you know, that's a question for today. I mean, you're using six strikes <laughs> and you know what you're saying. They should be the same if only I had an infinite number. So. Okay. Well, I, but, you know, if I used five strikes versus seven strikes, these graphs would look similar. It's not that I don't have enough strike prices because on average, I have 75% correlation between the variance swap return and the VIX return. Um, <clears throat> oh, and by the way, here I'm using the variance swap returns. So I'm not even using the options I guess I'm using the price of the portfolio. Yeah. I'm using that a little bit. But, but let's take a look at the difference, which is the return. So this, this inherits the quarterly pattern, but it's also positive. Right? So this shows that returns are, or the approximation of returns are predictable. That when returns on these options were high in the past, that predicts high returns in the future on the cross section of stock options. Yeah, I mean, I'd say, like, if you look at the difference now, you're implicitly considering a trading strategy, which is the one you're well aware of when you're, you're the long off, let's say you have static position options and, dealt, and dynamically trading its underlying. But now you also have a variance swap position, an actual variance swap position, not a synthetic. Um, well, Okay, I'm being a little bit fast and loose. And part of this is just for artistic control over what the graphs look like, to make them, um, to, to visually highlight this effect. But these graphs look very similar whether we, when we use actual returns and when we use variance swap returns. The, uh, the issue is that, um, let me just show you this approximation. <clears throat> so if I want to look at realized variance, I want to say realized variance, minus VIX variance, the price of variance is equal to return, right? I want to say this one. Yeah, on a spread position. One, that a spread and that position. requires the, yeah. the variance swap. But, right. but the end result is highly correlated with the returns on my dynamic portfolios and the graphs look identical. So we're not actually using a variance swap. We, or we don't need to use a variance swap. We can produce the same graphs using returns on actual option portfolios. Okay. They look a little bit prettier this way, and this way really, um, you know, has this motivating analysis with variance swaps. <clears throat> okay, so um, yeah, this is this is suggestive of momentum and of periodicity in that momentum. So let's <clears throat> okay. Let me show you the um, the t statistics at different lags, and. No surprise, when you do this univariate, they're all significant. If you look at the maturities separately, uh, hold on, I need to adjust my window here. We get lots of t-statistics bigger than two. One month, three months, four months, five, six, um, with nine and 12. So the, um, <clears throat> The quarterly lags are definitely significant. It appears that, that the cross section of volatility is most predictable at quarterly lags. Now in work with stock returns joined with Ronnie Sadka, we found something similar. <coughs> we found that the, stock, the cross section of stock returns is predictable actually for 20 years with a strong annual seasonal but we also found the same quarterly seasonal within one year. So, uh, so there's definitely something going on here besides constant momentum. Right. <clears throat> so um, what I'd like to do is present a very dense uh, picture of, uh, of strategies that combine all these features, just to show you what, what you can get. And let's see, 
I have decile sorts for year one, considering all the lags in year one, just the quarterly or just the non-quarterly. If you look at the deciles, the returns are basically monotonic across the decile, almost perfectly, not quite, but almost perfectly monotonic. And the, uh, the, the top decile minus the bottom decile earns a lot of money, either an excess return or an alpha with respect to some factors. But uh, what's also new is that this works for years two, three, um, you know, four is not significant, five. <clears throat> if you look at the, just looking at all, so year two means you use lags 13 through 24. Year three means lags 25 through um, what, 36, et cetera. And so looking at T statistics, we definitely get significant T statistics for all, but we particularly get um, positive T statistics for the quarterly lags. There's year three. If we look at year five, um, and we get a T statistic over three for year five, simply regressing on the four monthly lags that are seasonal five years ago. So, uh, so I do this because it's simpler than cross-section regression, and it just shows that no matter how you sort it, based on quarterly or non-quarterly, you can make money, but you particularly make money by emphasizing the quarterly lags. And, um, you know, it's not a phenomenon that just shows up in one year. Comment? What? Question? May I ask Is a question? Is there a question? Yes. Yes. Um, so it's not a surprise to me that um, you have these quarterly um, uh, seasonality because earnings are clearly the largest uh, event that occurs in any, um, in any um, um, stock and, and they affect the options enormously. But um, a suggestion is the following. There's a group of stocks for which earnings are almost completely uh, unimportant. And that group are the um, small cap bio, biotechs. Um, their uh, research results are extraordinarily important, but they're expected to lose money every quarter. So their earnings have almost no effect on the stock motion. So um, a suggestion to look at the effect of earnings is to make a portfolio just of um, biotechs and to examine them. Mm -hmm. Well, we did something even simpler. We just looked at stocks. We just eliminated all these uh, months where the stocks were reporting earnings and looked at the remaining sample and got the same pattern. And so we, we looked at the two thirds of months that were not quarterly earnings and the one third of months that were quarterly earnings and got similar patterns in both. And, um, <clears throat> And uh, you can probably tell by my expression that um, I did a ton of this with the stock returns because every referee from every journal on every revision asked us to look at earnings and dividends and the CEO's horoscope and, <laughs> the, and the announcement of earnings. There's the announcement and there's the actual payment and the announcement of dividends and the ex-dividend month. Uh, the option calendar, we were, that one scared us. So we did check that out. So we don't have an explanation, but it's not something uh, as simple as we would like. So I, I agree with your instincts there of, of finding some subset of stocks. You know, ETFs would be an interesting one uh, because they don't depend on one company. But um, could I uh, make a quick suggestion possibly yes. on this? Because earnings, while they are quarterly, are for the quarter. So they are generally not reported on the in the months three, three, six, nine, and 12. What they're reported after the quarter closes, so it would be lagged by a month normally, or even two. What does occur quarterly are the quarterly option expiration. You know, like we're all, all heard of things like triple witching and stuff like that. Right. And we do see a distinction between just on a individual stock level as a practitioner, there is a market difference between the court, the court, the monthly expiration, weekly, and especially quarterly. Large 
Florida, and because of that, it's you might be able to look um, just as a thought in terms of both volume and as it relates to open interest, because open interest in this is why a lot of these quarterly and annuals show larger would be different than say a more granular level like a weekly or even a daily option. Just a, just a thought. Yeah. Well, yeah, I agree with you. We, we were concerned because um, months don't have an e equal number of days, even if you do calendar months, right? There's this pesky thing that um, <clears throat> there's what, 52 weeks and a couple of days in a year. Yep. And, and yeah. uh, right, maybe February doesn't have enough days. Of course, we're using the option calendar, uh, but that's, that creates more concern because some months have four weeks and some have five, and that's roughly one out of four. So uh, I thought that might explain it, but we- Don't forget about leap year. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we separated it by the, there's this option calendar and we separated it into the option cycles since options are on uh, different cycles and the, the, that produces the same, same graph. So our contribution here is really just to exhibit this effect and, um, <clears throat> and, and you know, leave the room open for uh, future work. So there's one, one table that I really want to um, uh, mention here because we are running out of time and people may be getting hungry. Um, <clears throat> oh, this isn't explained by book to market or stock momentum. So you'll have to trust me on that um, uh, or bid ask spreads. But um, okay, <clears throat> I want to talk about value because there's a long literature and many people watching this have participated saying that you should buy um, options with low implied volatilities and sell options with high implied volatilities. So maybe what we're doing is just a really stupidly complicated way of accomplishing that. Mm. So I'd like to, um, oh, I'm going to admit Marco Avalanetta. Mm -hmm. All right. So stop <laughs> saying bad things about Marco Avalanetta. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> all right. So I want to talk about a measure of value versus momentum. So value is a stock where the price today, the price of the VIX portfolio is low compared to the historical variance. In contrast, momentum is a stock which had a, or an option portfolio that had a high return in the past. But return, I showed, is realized variance divided by historical VIX price or historical VIX variance. Right? So our measure of momentum is one where the realized variance is high compared to the historical option price. And that's slightly different than looking at value, which is when the realized variance historically is high compared to today's option price. Now these things are obviously going to be highly correlated. And so the table five presents a double sort on both value and momentum because value has been documented to produce positive returns in options by Goyal and Soretto and um, I, I think Karin Wu, among others. And you can see if you look at value going along the, the different rows or momentum going along the columns, both of them have an effect on return. If you pay a high price for options today compared to the historical price or compared to the historical realized variance, you get a lower return in the future. So both of these factors, value and momentum, are, uh, affect option returns, uh, but these are independent effects and one doesn't subsume the other. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> uh, let me, uh, are there any questions about this table or how to interpret it? No, it's easy to interpret. You should buy low and sell high. <laughs> you should buy low and sell high, yeah. And the only question is your standard of, you know, what do you compare it to, low versus high? Well, compare the option price today to the price 12 months ago, or compare it to the realized variance in the past 12 months. Okay. And both are good ways. One other question. You, you probably mentioned this at the beginning, but I forgot. When you're making your VIX portfolios, are you buying only... Uh, options with the same uh, duration, like one month options, or are you buying uh, like two month or, or longer? We are buying on the third Friday of the month options that expire one month later on the third Friday of the month. 
Okay. I assume that was satisfactory. Or, uh, or he yes. lost his internet connection. No, no, no. I just, I, that's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Okay, good. <clears throat> so let me, um, uh, I, I think I should be wrapping up now, Peter. Yeah. For one hour yeah. seminar. Okay, so um, let me give you the conclusions that we measure daily hedge, delta neutral monthly returns on model free um, equity VIX option portfolios. And as David Chimko uh, correctly picked up, the delta is not exactly zero. We use the formula for the continuous uh, option portfolio, which many theorists love. But of course, we implement this with a discrete option portfolio. But the actual deltas of these portfolios, at least the Black-Scholes deltas, are very close to zero. <clears throat> and they are rebalanced not continuously, but they are rebalanced daily with a finite portfolio of, you know, around six options. <clears throat> so these are actual returns, but it turns out that the dollar return, if we neglect the denominator, just look at the payoff, it is highly correlated with realized variance. So these retur the returns on these things are, are correlated with returns on variance swaps, but there's no approximation. We can use these actual option portfolios to me measure realized returns and um, to no one's surprise, they're negative. But we have a whole cross-section of these returns. And uh, <clears throat> we show that uh, there's momentum. That is, options that produce high returns in the past tend to have high returns in the future. And this doesn't happen because of stock momentum. Again, because these portfolios are roughly delta neutral. Uh, so this, they aren't terribly affected by stock risk. Um, this option momentum is largely quarterly. And if you look at the quarterly uh, frequencies, it lasts up to five years, being most prominent in the past one year, and, with, and without the reversal that DuPont and Thaler find in long-term stock returns. That's extremely interesting, Steve. <laughs> so, uh, okay. and, uh, well, well, thank you, Peter. Yeah, it's really implementing um, uh, your work with, uh, with uh, a lot of... Um, Hard work and uh, excellent work by Shui Chi. And yeah. um, quite a finding. I mean, so it's, um, it's very. Um, so you have a question from uh, Tony Corso. I'll just read it. So, um, so we put in chat that the Goyal original value paper was panel regression, where both historic realized vol and historic implied vol determined value. Yes. But he published a sort paper. Um, so I guess there's not actually a question in this, it's more a comment. Um, Tony, did you have a question for Steve or you just want yeah. to make your point? Okay. I'll, I'll comment because I read no, that paper ahead. multiple times and um, okay. it, it was inspirational. It was around the same time, I think 2008, as the Carr and Wu paper. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought I thought of it first and then was embarrassed to look at that Goyal and Toretto measure returns Friday to Friday. So Goyal and Soretto were measuring actual returns on options. The problem is it's a little bit arbitrary to choose at the money straddles or, you know, whatever um, uh, uh, Capadia and um, Bakshi and Capadia did. <clears throat> but they actually created um, these delta hedge option portfolios or roughly delta neutral portfolios um, to show, as Karn Wu did, that there is uh, predictability in the cross section of options on individual stocks. And Shui Chi and I have constructed portfolios, namely VIX portfolios, for mm -hmm. which we already know the delta of the portfolio, at least the continuous ideal portfolio, and it's model free. Right. So, um, so yeah. okay, it's clear. Um, and so basically, it's if you go on Soretto, use the VIX portfolios, that's what we're doing. Or if um, Bakshi and Kapadia use the VIX portfolios, it would be the same thing. Okay. And it's, I think there's an advantage in using the VIX portfolios, which is that um, you're, you know, so um, you mentioned briefly in your talk that they last one month. And then when you're trying to look at, let's say, a quarter instead of a month, you roll. And so one great thing about your setup is that, like, you're always going to have some options finishing in the money in your portfolio. <laughs> okay. Um, and, but if they roll, you know, let's say they had one option 
and uh, you know they attempted to roll. I mean, if that one option finished out of the money, well, you can roll. And what are you going to do? I right. mean, well, well, let, let me uh, give you a, a little uh, analogy here. A bowling ball is more dangerous than a knife yeah. because a knife is sharp only at the end, right. but a bowling ball is sharp everywhere. If you drop it on your foot, it will hurt no matter what the orientation is. Okay. So a, an at-the-money straddle um, has good vega, but only when it's, when it's at the money. And when the stock uh, shifts, an at-the-money straddle is no longer, or straddle is yeah. no longer at the money. But the VIX portfolio buys a whole U-shape, uh, of like a parabola for yeah. the option payoff. And then when you daily hedge it, you, you shift that parabola so the parabola is always at the money. So the VIX portfolio is always at the money. Yeah. And, and doesn't have to be rebalanced in the underlying options. Yeah. So it's um, the VIX portfolio sensitivity to, let's say. It, it maintains its variance. vega. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, yeah. And you just have to daily delta hedge it. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Um, and so. Like, so one feels that, like, you're, you know what you're getting returns on. <laughs> like, like, in the other words, it's a, you know, roughly speaking, it's a return on variance, roughly speaking. Okay, I know you're drawing a distinction, but yes. roughly speaking, it's a return on variance. And, um, you know, and then, but if you just, you know, as you pointed out, I mean, if what you did was to, bu to buy an at-the-money straddle, um, some particular, you know, then as time goes by, you know, that particular strike that was at is like no longer relevant, let's say, it's no longer at the money, as you said. And um, so, you know, it's hard to like believe that, let's say there's any, I don't know, strong uh, stationarity over time when, you know, what you were using in the past was always very different from each other over time. Yeah. <clears throat> so, right. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think we should wrap up. It's uh, 10 after seven. Um, so I want to thank everybody for, for attending. Uh, just mentioned um, that the talk uh, we had last week was video recorded and the YouTube video is now in place. So if you go to YouTube and you want to see it, it's there. And likewise, we'll have this talk up in a week on YouTube. So, um, Actually, um, I guess there's one more question, but uh, we have a question. yeah, we do have a question. So I just saw it. So from Tony Corso, he said, for six option strike weights, did you use a classic formula weighting, um, imperfect piecewise parabola, yes. or did you use other weights? We, we used the VIX methodology as published by the CBOE, where the weights are equal to yeah. okay, I saw you divided by the strike price squared. Okay. Okay. So, um, no optimization or model dependence, anything. Uh, we, okay. we, were, we did a lot of complicated stuff to make this paper simple. <laughs> right. it, yeah. it, it took a lot of decisions and uh, really a fantastic work by Shuai Chi. Um, and right, a lot of decisions like the third Friday to the third Friday, which had been made in previous literature and mm -hmm. sort of combined the literature to make the simplest decision at every stage. So we have the actual VIX portfolio on a Friday held for four to five weeks expiring on another Friday. So we don't need a model to compute any weights. We just have to do the bookkeeping to measure returns. Yeah. And uh, um, this is a great methodology. If there are any PhD students or advisors, this methodology is wide open for application to a lot of problems. Um, just as uh, there's a monthly um, a crisp file of stock returns, there's now a simple methodology for producing an equivalent file of uh, option returns. Yeah, um, I just have a comment. So, um, so I know with respect to S and P 500, um, like so the VIX, um, well, the calculation of VIX for S, you know, which is of course for S and P 500. Um, there's a famous paper about manipulation. Um, you probably know it, and um, so. Um, so anyway, I mean, I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud, you know, if let's say there is manipulation in the uh, closing prices of especially deep out of the money put options, um, you know, whether that 
effects, the actual ability to um, get the returns that you're getting. This, I don't see why it wouldn't, but, <clears throat> but anyway, it's worth thinking about. I mean, we're computing payoffs on the options yeah. using the obvious exercise value. And uh, bid ask spreads are a concern because option spreads are wide. Mm -hmm. So there are some diagnostics there. You know, if you pay the full bid ask spread all the time uh, all across all stocks, you don't make money. But if you were um, a, a little bit skillful, you could cut that in half and these strategies would be profitable. Can I ask, I'm sorry to uh, jump in one last time, but one, I used to uh, do work at the CME back when it was NYMEX and introduced variance swaps, uh, well, realized variance contracts. Um, and unfortunately, as Pete Carr and I have talked about this in the electricity market, but it was just seen recently in the oil market, um, we couldn't use a log contract to, mo to model for anything because we had negative prices. Mm -hmm. So while it's not model dependent per se, it, it, it's based on some assumptions which are not, yeah. you, you talked about further research and you mentioned the energy market. That's the only reason why I even brought it up because the dynamics of it have made the CME go to their hybrid version, you know, of Bachelier because you can't use, you can't assume the log normal distribution and that's up pervasive throughout the energy market where it's actually, well, yeah, so. Hmm. Uh, any thoughts about what we might do to combat that type of issue? Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, if I try to brainstorm here, yeah. the, the log portfolio works well for a geometric type security Yep. But if you have an arithmetic security, you could try and take the price of an option portfolio that pays out a regular old parabola instead of this yeah, curious log right. thing. So, so would you so then get the, but then uh, without it being, I'm just trying to think of what it would be with the, would it a volatility swap on the, those as opposed to the variance swap, would that then be yeah. additive? Since yeah, yeah, so the, uh, the variance swap uh, as uh, typically traded, and yeah. I'm, uh, there are other practitioners uh, on this uh, on Zoom, but um, it, it pays off the sum of squared returns. That, that right. is the sum of squared percentage changes, but instead you could create a contract that pays out the sum of squared price changes and the level of the price. So the price goes from, from $3 to negative $3. That's a $6 price change. Right. And mm -hmm. you know it's an infinite percentage or two hundred percent price percentage <laughs> change, but um, if the price goes from zero to right. negative one, that's a one dollar drop. Right. And you could square that and add it up over time. Yeah, and it, it, it just gets very difficult because that where where did that get, ties in with say fixed income as well? If you're looking at it based on on the returns there where you're saying, you know, you're not looking at the interest rate or something like that. You're looking at the actual value. So you're looking at the differentiation, say from a hundred <laughs> from par uh, at that you could possibly potentially do something like that to try to smooth around, you know, but it's still, but to me, it still feels not clean. Just my intuition. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, um, you know, what Steve said is exactly right. And um, actually, like, I would argue <laughs> that the, you know, this alternative approach with where you're trying to create squared price changes and you're using um, the parabola, you're creating a parabola using options. That, that turns out to be, quote, more robust, I would say, <laughs> than, you know, the, the, let's say, the more standard alternative where, you, where you're creating squared returns and you're using um, this log profile. So, so the big difference is that say that um, you, when you allow, you know, when you think of, when you do discrete monitoring as you did, you know, looking every day, <coughs> you really do replicate, um, if you have a continuous strikes, so I still need that. Uh, you really do replicate the sum of squared price changes using the parabola. Whereas, you know, as Steve mentioned, when, even with a continuous strikes, even if you had it, if you're doing daily delta hedging as he was, um, and you're trying to create squared returns, you're not going to do it. Okay. Right. 
that, okay. that was yeah that was kind of the thing if we're only doing daily on something that's calculated to the second you know you're you know and especially when you get into individual stocks yeah individual intraday volatility you know again it's mean reverting and for the sorry to close but um you're gonna you're gonna probably miss a lot of the implied vol on the individual equities more so I would have to believe than you would on the index. But that's again, just an intuition. So. Yeah, so that's because let's say individual stocks jump more. <laughs> right, okay, right. exactly. Yeah, that's what I was kind of thinking with yeah. going through your yeah. whole thing with earnings and all these kinds of things tying in, you've got a lot more stochastic events and things like that coming right. through, which would drive it. To, yeah. Just, so yeah, we very, agree. Very yeah. cool paper though. I just wanted to make sure I said that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, thanks very much. Um, again, Shui Chi uh, will be on the market this year. Uh, of course, with COVID, the, uh, the market is going to be online rather than physical. Mm -hmm. And this methodology is really applicable to a lot of research problems. So I hope that the other PhD students learn about it and apply it uh, because it shows how to create you know, model-free returns on options and has a lot of applications to asset pricing. And in fact, Shui Chi is doing that now, looking at um, <clears throat> explaining uh, the variance premium and option returns. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, hope to see you again next week. Okay. All right. So I'm going to end this okay. session. Th okay. Thank you for the invitation, okay. Peter. Yeah, and bye -bye. thank you all for your comments. Bye-bye.